I met with one of my college professors, my favorite college professor, I'll just say it. Yeah. Um, and he was, <laughs> he, he was very adamant that, you know, I, I had some specific skill sets that he thought would be very, uh, very beneficial to society in general. But he said, he said, there's one thing that you don't do. He goes, you don't listen to people. Life changing conversation, hearing that from a mentor, uh, you know, college professor mentor to say, to look right at me and say, you don't listen to people. That, that, that changed my, that changed my mind, that changed my, my focus on now I sit back and I listen and I observe. Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, John O'White. I'm the founder of Clarity an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world. At Clarity, our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership, and I believe today's episode is going to do exactly that. So let's jump into another episode of Leadership Conversations. Welcome to Leadership Conversations. I'm John O'White, and I am really excited to introduce um, our guest today. Our guest is Mark Klitzer-White. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Uh, now, first off, It'd be great if you can just tell us a little bit about um, the role you're in and the organization you work for. Okay, great. Um, yeah, my name is Mark Klitzwhite. I am the president, CEO, and superintendent of the most unique family of charter schools anywhere in the world. Uh, we are EdKey Inc., and we have 26 individual schools and programs uh, comprising 11,000 students and about 1,100 employees. Uh, when I say we're the most unique, each one of those uh, 26 programs has their own individual mission and vision and serves very specific populations of students in specific communities. So that's what makes us so unique. We aren't a cookie cutter model of education. We, um, we drop in uh, schools based on what the communities need, not based on what um, our needs are. Mm -hmm. I've been in this role since 2016, um, since the spring of 2016. And uh, we've seen uh, just some massive growth as an organization. We started out, when I started out, we had about 14 schools and programs. And like I said, we're up to 26. We had about 4,000 students. We're up to about 11,000. So uh, wow. we've grown exponentially over the last few years. Yeah, that's, uh, that's incredible. And uh, I can't wait to, to, uh, to chat about leadership with you because, like you said, I think uh, the... Uh, I, I guess how unique you are in the in the space with what you do is really fascinating. But before we jump into that, really the uh, the heart of leadership conversations is to look at the story of leaders like yourself. So I'd love to hear um, as much of the Mark story of leadership as as you want to tell. I guess thinking about how you became a leader and and looking back at the story, yeah, Mark's story. Uh, feel free to go for it. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, I think it all goes back to, um, I was a three sport athlete, um, in high school and in college. And I think a lot of, a lot of my leadership, uh, skills and abilities, uh, came about, uh, through athletics, um, you know, being, being a leader on the court, being a leader on the field, um, just being able to, to communicate and to work with, uh, people of all different strengths and abilities, um, really molded my ability to become in, uh, to become a leader, uh, mm. here, um, yeah. and, and, you know, in the role I'm in now, uh, that being said, I've been in education now for, like I said, 28 years. Um, this is my 28th year yep. and I started out yep. in the classroom and, uh, was only in the classroom for, uh, two years before they said, you've got a different skill set. Um, they identified that I was uh, one of those natural leaders. Um, because I was more of a guide by the side than I was, um, you know, the heavy hand top down, uh, leader. I've always just been the guide by the side to be able to help people, um, to be able to discover what their strengths are and to be able to flourish, um, using their strengths. 
So um, that's that's really in a nutshell. That's that's how I became a leader. Um, is someone saw something in me and um, followed through, uh, guided me into that role, and um, I've taken it and just run with it since. Yeah, amazing. Uh, yeah, thank amazing. you for sharing. Thank you. So, tell me a little bit about. Uh, I guess for you, what what are some of the moments, if you look back, that have had the biggest impact on forming you as the leader and the person that you are? Um, so I, I think first and foremost, I look back to my, my, my parents. Um, I was, I was one of those, uh, high school students that had their father as their uh, high school principal. Yeah. So, um, I, I got to see leadership in, in all sorts of different fashions that way. Um, so it, not that that's unique. You find you find a lot of uh, a lot of individuals that go into education have other family members that were already in education. So um, you know it's just it's just the way of life, I guess. But um, I also think back to uh, you know when I was in college, when I wasn't sure what I was going to do uh, when it came to um, a career. But um, I, I met with one of my college professors, my favorite college professor, I'll just say it. Yeah. Um, and he was he, he was very adamant that, you know, I, I had some specific skill sets that he thought would be very, uh, very beneficial to society in general. But he said, he said, there's one thing that you don't do. He goes, you don't listen to people. Life changing conversation, hearing that from a mentor, uh, you know, college professor mentor to say to look right at me, and say, you don't listen to people. That 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 changed my that changed my mind, that changed my my focus on. Now I sit back and I listen and I observe and, you know, a lot of leaders like to talk and they like to be the voice and, and all that. I have I have such a wonderful team that works works with me that every one of them knows where their roles are and what they're doing. They're the voice. They're the voice of the organization. I sit and listen. And if things go a little bit sideways, you know, conversation or bring up maybe another idea to say, Hey, you know, have we thought about this aspect of how we can get better at what we do? Um, but listen, listen, listen. I, I can't stress that enough with any leader out there. If you don't listen to your people, they're going to have nothing to say. Mm, I like that. If you don't listen to your people, they're going to have nothing to say. Uh, I, I'm very interested in that story you told about your uh, your favorite college professor. How like that's such a direct piece of feedback. What was it about your relationship with that professor that, and about maybe who you are, um, that meant you were able to take that feedback on? Wow, um, think, thinking back a few years now, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think. I think the the reason that it resonated so well with me is first of all I respected him as as someone that was an absolute wonderful person in their field, knowledgeable, um, and never gave up on me. And I'll I'll share another story with you: is I wasn't a good student. I wasn't a good high school student. I wasn't a good college student. The model of education that I grew up in didn't work for me. It didn't have there. There wasn't that um, uh, diversity instruction. There wasn't any of those types of things that were embedded. It was very rote, memory, yeah. learning. Uh, you know, regurgitate what 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 you hear, um, and just make sure that 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 you can take a test. That didn't that didn't work for me. So I wasn't a good student. He never gave up on me though. Even in college, when you know my my grade my grades were below average, and and I, I'm okay with that because that's that that's how I've grown to to be able to help the organization I'm in now is because not all kids learn the same. Not all not all not all staff members learn the same. Not all you know, not all leaders learn the same. You've gotta you've gotta be able to adjust and shift and move and pivot as much as possible to be able to find those strengths and, and that and he found that in me and his very direct conversation with me about listen literally changed my life and I can't thank him enough for that. Yeah. I, I think it's a, I, I can just understand why that's had such a profound impact on you because I have just come to believe more and more every year that listening is such a game changer. If someone for leadership, if someone doesn't listen well, it makes everything else 
almost impossible. And if someone does listen well, it can cover so many other challenges or um, areas that they need to grow in. But if they listen well, you just uh, it, it's such a it's such a superpower. Um, so, what what have you learned about listening? You know, let's let's talk about listening because obviously that was uh, had a big impact on you as a leader. But now, you know, with what you know today, say there's a leader who's listening to this going, yeah, I, I don't know how well I listen. What advice would you give to someone about how to listen well? Develop your discernment skills to be discerning with what the with the information that's being told to you. I think I think if you can if you can cut through all the minutia and get to the root of whether it's a problem, whether it's it's a celebration, you know, how did you get to that to that celebration point? If you can figure out all of the the intricacies within listening and hearing what they're saying, because you and I both know that people will come and they'll give you lip service and have absolutely nothing to really say of value. But then someone else may come and just have three or four words to say to you, but they're the most profound three or four words that could alter an entire business model. And so being able to use discernment, I think, is is really the key. And if you can develop the discernment skills in line with your listening and hearing, it's it, it, everything becomes very clear. Hence, clarity, I love it. Yeah. Uh, so unpack discernment. I, I, I think um, particularly for someone, once again, who might be listening and going, okay, I, I feel like I... Uh, I listen okay. How do you how do you grow in and how do you practice, um, you know, growing in discernment? I, I think there there's trial and error with all of this stuff. Um, again, I think it comes down to having the right people in the right places doing the right things. They're going to get you the right information, and if they don't, there's the you know there's the ability for us to be able to verify that that information wasn't correct. Okay, so now um, let's say employee A has given you this information. Okay, that information wasn't 100% accurate or they left out some information. Yeah. I go back and ask, I ask questions. It's not accusing, you know, there's no, none of that. It's, it's, it's done with uh, what I consider kindness, which is one of our um, core values. I do it with kindness. I say, listen, I, I hear what you're saying here, but what, what about this step? What about this step? What about this step? What? What's missing here for me? Help, help, help bring clarity to what I need to see so that we can have a broader conversation about it. Because I, I love the fact that you're telling me these results are coming in or you have a data, data wall that has all this data on it. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with the data? What, how are we changing, adjusting things to make sure that our students are being successful? So just being able to ask additional questions but take a look at the bigger, and by taking a look at that bigger picture, you've got to be able to try to see that bigger picture and then know if you, if you make this move over here to the left, you know, you, 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 whatever that decision is, what does that affect way out in the future? What does that affect uh, six months from now? What does that affect in an operating system somewhere? And yeah. so when I talk about discernment, it's really about trying to build that trust in, build that Build that team. Know that you have the right people in the right places that are going to give you the right information. And then if if you think that something doesn't look right or sound right, just ask the clarifying questions. Go, go, go to them. But, you know, nothing, again, nothing accusatory. Have a conversation. I think there's a lot more respect that's built then. And then if there was something that was missed, 90% of the time, I'm going to say it's not going to get missed again. Maybe even a higher percentage than that. And so that's, so, so to me, that's really what discernment is, is being able to see that the, the clarifying pieces of what needs to happen or what needs to be done or the information that's being brought forward. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I, I love how you mentioned having the right people in the right places at, you know, at the right times. Um, if we take a step back from that, can you unpack that philosophy and, and what that looks like in a, in a bit more of a general uh, because it's such a powerful idea. So I think that um, when you look at the people that are in your employ, you have a moral imperative to make sure that they're successful. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can help people be successful is to make sure that one, 
they enjoy what they do. Two, they have the skill sets, or some people call it the bandwidth, to be able to do what you're asking them to do or what their position requires. And then three, do they have the motivation to be able to do what's required of them in that in that position or or with those tasks that they've been assigned? By by asking again, by asking those questions, first you start out with, do you really like what you do? Okay, if you if not, what would you like to do for the organization? Okay, we don't have that available. Now, let's take a let's take a step back. We don't have that available, but I see here's where I see your skill sets. Do you see them the same way? Mm. And I, I, I say I say that that's a 50 50 question, really, because, you know, what obviously what I see is one thing and what they see is something different. But if you're if you've already opened it up to them and they're saying this is what I would like to do. OK, how does that fit within your job that, that we have here or the tasks that we have assigned, um, you know, in your department? How does that how does that filter through? And so, again, having, you know, our, our core values are transparency, integrity, communication, and kindness. All four of those core values fall into making sure that you have somebody in the right place at the right time doing the right things for the right reasons. And, and so I, I don't know if you want more information on that, but it's, to, to me, it's, it's all about the communication piece, making sure that you're doing it with kindness, um, making sure that that you aren't putting them into a position. Here's where integrity comes in, putting them into a position that you know they're not going to be successful in. Yeah. And and then the transparency piece of, hey, listen, you know, let's we can have transparent conversations about this. Okay, you're you're not you're not doing so well right here. What can I do to help you? And that's where I step in is what can I do to help you so that you can get there? Because I know you have the skill sets. Mm. Are we missing the motivation? Are we missing maybe, maybe some bandwidth in there and you and you don't feel comfortable with that yet? Um and, and so just having those open uh, communication um, conversations. Um, one, one thing that comes to mind as you unpack that, Mark, I can imagine a leader, uh, and, and I see this all the time when I'm, when I'm coaching leaders, going, oh, I feel like it's risky to ask someone what would they like to do because I'm afraid, like you said, we won't be able to cater to that and I don't want to lose them because they're feeling filling a role you know mm-hmm. that that's something that I, I feel like is a bit of an attitude or perspective that I come across quite a lot how do you do you ever have those thoughts or how do you how do you approach it in light of that sort of perspective I, I, I do and that's where that's where um, you know the EQ comes in mm. you know 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 your people know know who they are um, know know what conversations you can have with them um, and, you know, know what verbiage, um, that they'll understand, uh, because you can have, you know, you can have someone who is a very high, high level thinker that, um, maybe can't use layman's terms when they're trying to, uh, communicate, yep. but their skill sets are, are fantastic in that, in that world, in that sphere, help them, help them to be able to work on their communication skills, help them to be able to, you know, you, you probably don't want someone who um, you know might be uh, a numbers person you know someone with that with that that math brain that that super science math brain you probably mm-hmm. don't want them doing too many press releases uh, and using language arts to 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 um, to um, get the information out so again it's 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 all about build that trust with your people make sure that they know that there, there's no threatening way to come forward and say this. I want to help you do your job better. I want you, I, I want you to make sure that th- this is the career that you want. This is where you want to be. And if you're really, really good at this area, then maybe maybe this other part of that area, part of that job description isn't the best fit for you. So let's find someone else. Or what can I do to help build your people capability to be able to get there so that you can do that piece? Yeah, that's... Um... That's that's really profound. I was thinking um, another thing that that crossed my mind is um, how often do you find that your perspective on what someone's strengths are is different to what they see? Or you know, when you have that conversation about this is what I see, what do you see? From your experience, how much are you on the mark, and 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 how often are you completely off? Like, what what would you say is the is your experience of that? I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna fall back on the old eighty twenty rule. 
<laughs> just um, it, it's again, it's we're very fortunate to be able to have the high employee retention that we do in, in our organization. So I don't see a lot of the turnover where we have to worry about, you know, getting people to fit into specific roles or to do things. They, they've been hired into those roles. And now that they've been hired into those roles, we, we have the ability to be able to monitor and see, okay, are they doing what, what's necessary and what needs to be done? And I, you know, I just, I don't, I don't have a lot of heartburn, if you will, with mm. when people make mistakes. And so I think the having having grace and kindness when you're dealing with people who who make mistakes or maybe who can't fill certain job duties or or job requirements. Yeah. If they can't do that, then it's a conversation. And then we say, okay, how do we pick up the pieces? How do we move forward? And let's just go. And we we don't have time to dwell on what's happened in the past. And, and again, building that people capability and building the, those trust, those trust lines mm. um, is, is imperative to, to the success of, you know, especially in my organization, it's, 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 it's really the backbone of who we are. Yeah, I, I think your employee re retention, because you were saying is it 97% uh, retention? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That is such an outlier. And um, I, I I guess I flip it around and I wonder why is why is the opposite so true? I, I just think so many leaders, and I'm not I'm not saying about um, leaders who don't who aren't aware, who aren't self aware. I'm thinking leaders that I meet who go, I keep losing people. I know that I'm I'm leading this, and and I feel like there's a lack of trust. And it's the leader themselves going, how do I change that? I want to create a higher trust environment, but I'm struggling to do that. Um, or sometimes they even say, I'm doing everything I can, but it's like the people, uh, you know, they're just cynical or skeptical of me. How do you do that high trust environment that, because I feel like that's the piece that leads to the employee retention plus picking the right people like you've talked about. But, you know, a, a leader like that, what, what would you say to them in terms of how to really develop a truly high trust environment? Well, I think, I think first and foremost, you need to, you know, you need to have the conversations, those exit interviews with them. Okay, why why exactly are you leaving? Is it more money? Is it the climate and culture here? Is it uh, benefits? Is it you know? You can go down a whole laundry list of reasons, and and yeah. most most of the most of what we see here um, is people leave because of benefits. I see that more than anything else. Not not necessarily with our organization, but like here in mm -hmm. the state of Arizona. That's why that's why people are leaving their jobs is because they want they, they think they can get better benefits someplace else or they or they do get better benefits. Mm. But the cynical side, that's what I call playing the long game. Mm. That's when you have to really sit back and you listen and you watch and you pay attention because people that leave loudly are probably the ones that are probably should have gone in the first place. The ones that leave <laughs> quietly and kind of sneak out the back door, those are the ones you want to find out why they left. Yeah. Those are the ones you want to have those conversations with. <laughs> oh, that's so good. I'm just laughing because I think that is absolute gold. <laughs> that's such a great rule of thumb. The ones who leave loudly are, are often the ones who sort of needed to go anyway, but it's the ones who just quietly you lose and sneak out the back door. They're the ones you really need to find out what, what, you know, what was it? Why is it that, that we weren't able to keep you? Um, yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so and, and, if, and if you have, I'm sorry, and if, if you yeah. have those conversations, again, if you have those exit conversations, you can always talk to them and say, okay, what would have, what, what would have it, it have taken to change oh. your mind to stay with the organization? I'm not going to ask you back, but what would it have changed? What, what one thing could I have done as a leader? And a lot of leaders don't want to own that either. They don't want mm -hmm. that personal accountability themselves. Hey, you know what? I'm the problem that they're leaving. I'm the reason that they're leaving. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But yeah. you need to ask and you need to find out and you need to own it. If it is the, your leadership style that's causing people to leave, then you need to figure out what your leadership style is doing that and have those conversations, those transparent conversations to be able to build that trust in. Because if you think that someone's leaving and they aren't going to talk to employees that are still working for you, 
and say, I can't, you know, I can't believe so-and-so, I can't believe you're still staying there because of, because of the leadership or whatever it is, mm-hmm. they're going to talk to their, their friends and they're going to let their friends know why they left. Yeah. So you may as well find out first before you hear it from others. <laughs> oh, I'm just laughing because that's so true. Um, and um, uh, so EQ, when you're thinking of people you're hiring, something that, or you're managing, something that I've been pondering recently and scratching my head over is what do you do when you, maybe you hire them or maybe you come into a role where you've got someone on your team and you realize, ah, oh, there's a bit of a lack of self-awareness here. There might be a low, e, low EQ that they really need to grow mm-hmm. in. But my, the problem that I've experienced and, and coaching leaders who've experienced this is that sometimes you feel like there's no way to approach this with this person where um, they're going to get it. Or whenever I try to bring an angle to it, they misinterpret. Um, how, yeah, that, that's something really interesting. Do you have any thoughts on uh, hiring or managing people who might ha- struggle in the emotional intelligence area and, 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 and how to go about that? Uh, I do. Uh, because there are there are plenty of uh, you know employment opportunities for people with lower EQ. Mm. Um, you know if 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 you hire a leader with low EQ, that's a problem. Yeah. If you hire someone who is going to be a follower or or um, you know in a position where they might not have um, any any type of you know authority or reporting structure under them. You can get away with people uh, that may have a little lower EQ. So it, 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 it really just depends on what you're hiring for. And if they're already hired in the position, what can you do to help them uh, to be successful in the tasks that you give them? Not necessarily that you need them to, to uh, you know, be superstars, but mm-hmm. what, what can you do to help them out? Because... I will, I will tell you that within our organization, there are, there are some people that have, um, uh, you know, a lack of self-awareness. Um, mm. they're, they're typically the ones that, um, you hear from a lot, um, mm. in, in, in different, in different ways, but being able to work with them and say, okay, let's focus you back in on, this is the task at hand. This is what we need to get done. What can I do to help you here instead of, um, I guess the best, the best way to look at that would be like herding cats. You, you just you ju- you just can't do it, and so let's let's focus in. Let's get some laser focus on this is what we need. This is the task at hand. This is what we need to get done. Can you do that? And then come back to me, and let's move on to the second thing, because new new leaders that come in, you know it as well as I do. New leaders that come in want to go a hundred miles an hour and get everything done all in one shot. Mm. That never works out well for anybody. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, so true. Uh, so tell me about your hiring process, Mark, because with 97% retention, like, like I said, that's just, that's just an amazing KPI. Like that's, that's an amazing uh, piece of fruit from a lot of the things that you must be doing. Um, so when you are looking to hire someone, particularly say at an uh, executive or, or leadership level in one of the schools or for your team, say, say uh, you created a new role or for some reason... Um, there was a really, you know, a, a, a key sort of role that you needed to fill. What do you think about? What's the process you go through with with hiring? Uh, the the best advice I can give if you're hiring someone into into a leadership role, they, it's not maybe it's not somebody that's worked for you before, and you're hiring them up into a leadership role. But mm-hmm. if it's someone new coming into the organization, you get your trusted people on a panel, and you do panel interviews with them. So that everybody gets their say, whether, you know, yes, this, this would be a good fit culturally for us, or, you know what, not, not a good cultural fit for Ed Key in general, or, you know, they're newer, they can, they, we think we can help build them into, um, you know, fitting into the culture of Ed Key. And so it's, it's really just a matter of making sure you have the right people on the, on the interview panels. Um, and then if it's, and if it's a really high level position, uh, let's say like an assistant superintendent or something like that, I'll meet with them one-on-one, um, after, um, after they go through a panel interview, um, they may send me one or two uh, candidates. Uh, but again, this, it, it doesn't happen just because we have, 
we have so many people that stay and mm -hmm. and and enjoy and love what Ed Key is all about. So um, yeah, the panel interview is huge. And I know there are a lot of people out there that do panel interviews, but mm -hmm. again, don't have the same people on the panel every time. Maybe someone local from the school, um, you know, a, a, a teacher that actually works at the school should be on the panel. Uh, maybe an assistant superintendent that that person wouldn't report to. Maybe that person should be on the panel too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, human, someone from human resources, you know, switch it up, have different people uh, being able to come in and, and give their opinions on, hey, yeah, this person would be a great fit for the organization or, you know what, we, we need to keep looking. Yeah, that's great. I think I agree about the power of a panel because um, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes there'll be a red flag that one person picks up that you wouldn't have and you go, oh, actually, yes. And other times there'll be a red flag that you think you picked up that when you actually discuss as a, you know, with other uh, panelists, you, you realize, oh, I, I probably misread that. And I think that yeah. is crucial because it's often, um, though, those things are often very obvious once you have a group of people involved. And I, I love that. I love that advice. Uh, so let's go yeah. back to the right, the right people, you know, in the right place at the right time with the right, you know, that, that, that sort of sequence. Uh, what, what are you looking for? You've got your core values, but what are you looking for in terms of who a person is? Do you have any thoughts on who, what you look for as the right person for any job with Ed Key? Do you have any thoughts on that in terms of the sort of person you want to employ? Well, we want, you know, we want people that are going to, you know, embrace the core values, um, mm. that are going to embrace the, the, the moniker of, you know, where every child is known, where, you know, people that are going to embrace the, 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 the possibility of change. How, how difficult is change on people? Mm. Education is evolving. And if, and if the COVID outbreak didn't teach us one thing, the antiquated system of education and the way it's taught is outdated. It is completely outdated. And if we don't, and if we don't step forward and, and, and change how we're educating individuals, we've lost a huge opportunity. So when we look at who we want to bring into the organization, we want people that are going to be able to embrace, you know, like I said, the change, the, the core values, the, the mission and vision of whatever school they're at, or if it's the mission and vision of ed key, depending on what that role is, we want to find people who have a track record of success who have a track record of of doing the best they can even in very difficult situations i mean education is 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 a rough industry mm. uh, and, you know used to be people used to think of education as being all you know flowers and and helping kids and you know it, it, it's it's rough out there it's rough out there i mean yeah. it's um you know education has changed it's evolved and um there are a lot higher expectations from parents, from staff, from administration, from school boards, from governing bodies, from the departments of education. There are a lot higher standards that people are looking for that have really come to light since this pandemic. And so if I'm hiring you into a leadership role within the organization, are you going to be able to adapt? Are you going to be able to change? Are you going to be able to be that support person that I need you to be for the schools? Uh, you know, there's there's all kinds of different things that that I look at from my perspective, but the most important perspective is what's best for kids. Is this the right person to do what's best for kids? And and if I can get uh, if I get the right answer, if I hear the right answer in an interview, or if the interview panel hears those right answers, we're pretty we're pretty certain that we're going to have someone that's going to going to be a long long haul uh, employee for our organization. Yeah, that's that's just fantastic. I what I'm hearing there is some real uh, clarity around who your organization is and what's most important to you, and that is very clearly driving uh, finding people who are going to be really aligned with that. So if we take that, uh, how did you come to such a clear understanding of the purpose of EdKey and, and the values? Was that there? before you began five years ago, or is that something that you've really crafted in the past five years? You know, I'd, I'd, I'd almost defer that question off to, off to my, my, uh, my team. Uh, mm. they, they would probably be able to give you a little better answer than I can. Um, but I do know there was a lot of turmoil when I, 
uh, when they were looking for the C a new CEO and, and hired me, there's a lot of turno turmoil, a lot of turnover, um, a lot of, a lot of issues going on within the organization, financially, student outcomes wise, there were just a lot of, of, of loose ends out there that were leading to essentially the demise of the organization. Sure. And so, uh, and so when I came in, um, one of the first things I did is I, I had to take a look. Obviously, you look at the finances first. You say, okay, we got to fix something here. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it, no, none of the rest of it matters. So by fixing some of the financial stuff, we were, we were able to get back on track. And then we, could, then we could switch right over to saying, okay, what can we get back into the schools, classrooms, all that stuff. So, you know, I can't really speak for before my time other than the fact that when I came in, it was, it was, um, it was full of a lot of challenges. And, uh, you know, I'm very, again, very fortunate and blessed uh, beyond measure to have the team that I do. And, and you know, the, we were looking for 180 teachers the first year I, I came on. This last year, we were looking for 27. <laughs> and the other reason we were looking for 27 is because we expanded and our, and our student population had grown so much that we needed to get new positions filled. Wow. Incredible. That's... Uh... Yeah, that's just amazing, Mark. There, I can just imagine the leaders out there. I know I'm listening to that, going, "That that's such a good feeling." <laughs> that's uh, for so many reasons to be able to to be in that in that place, uh, and and also because you know that represents so many people who are really loving what they're doing and, and enjoying being part of something bigger than themselves. Um, so, how do you? And I know we've already touched on this a little bit. So how do you make sure you're finding someone when, when you're hiring into these roles? What do you look for to make sure you're finding the right, the right person for the right job? So we talked about who you're looking for, but how do you try to find someone that's going to really flourish doing that particular role? How do you and your team do that? So I, I think we do it backwards. I, <laughs> I honestly think we do it backwards. We find the people that are the best fit for our, our culture and for, um, you know, who Ed Key is and, and the students we serve, we look for that person first and then train them into doing specific, um, specific duties or whatever. Our professional development is absolutely amazing. Um, mm. I, it, quick con quick story. On that, um, having a conversation with the chief financial officer, um, and I'm sure, and I'm sure you've seen this out, published out there somewhere. But mm. we literally had the conversation where he's like, "Well, he goes, we're going to spend all this money on training these people, and then he goes, you know, the history that we that we had before before you got here. You know, they're, we're going to train them, and they're going to leave." And I just looked at him. I said, "I said, you've got to understand that if we're in a worse situation if we don't train them and they stay." <laughs> it, 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 you know, it, it's it, the professional development piece. So, so yeah, so we hire people who have the, who have the, the personality and the, and, you know, they all have, they all have resumes, you know, you can make your resume look as, as glorious as you want. Um, but word of mouth also, the education space isn't that big. And so a lot yeah. of people, a lot of us know each other throughout the entire education space, you know, here, here in the, here in the United States, I mean, coast to coast, it's, it's, you, you cross paths with a lot of educational folks throughout your career. And so when, when you get a recommendation saying, Hey, you know, we've got this uh, assistant superintendent, I know you don't have a position right now, but future planning says we may need them for this or for this or for this. Okay. Are they available now? Okay. Let's hire them. Let's hire them and then work them into those other roles, mm. bring them in, get them to learn the culture and then figure out what those exact skill sets are that they're going to that they're going to be able to step into and and take over and to be able to help the team as a whole. So yeah, a little bit backwards. Yeah, I I I, and I love it. I think um, I haven't thought about it as back as backwards before, but you're right. It's saying let's just find the right people. Let's find the right people for our organization, and let's get them on board. When we come across them, let's hire them. And then let's let's train them for the role that they're going to flourish in and 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 make it work. Um, that's yeah, I, I completely agree. And so let's talk about managing managing people because it's uh, one thing that naturally comes to mind when I hear these sort of stories is there is that little bit of 
um, what there's that there's that little bit of cynicism I think because of leaders. If I think of leaders out there who maybe have just had a really terrible experience with someone that they found very difficult, and they hear these sort of stories and and they're a bit of an eye roll or 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 the perspective like the CFO said, or well you know track record says that these people are going to leave. How do you manage your people when when you've got those sort of core values? How do you manage people really? really well and really really tightly but also keep such a, an amazing culture and i know we've touched on a little bit a little bit of this already but i can just hear imagine leaders out there listening and, and going well how do you actually do that how do you keep that culture how do you manage people and i'm interested to know what specifically you do you know what do you measure um how often do you meet can you answer that Sure. So um, I will tell you that as a as a support team, um, you know, a lot of a lot of people look at and say, oh, they're the management team, they're, you know, their district or whatever. We're actually just a support team. That's mm -hmm. that's that's first and foremost. So my team understands that we're here to support the schools and the people at the schools and the students, uh, the staff. We're here to support them. They have an ask. We don't say no. We say, let's see what we can do. Let's you yeah. know, let's let's build that. So it's not. It's not this top-down authoritarian structure that a lot of people look at in leadership roles. And if and if you're a leader that that that's your main focus, you're in leadership. You're in leadership role because you want power, not because you're trying to make people better. You want power. And so, for us, it's all about that support piece. And it's not you know no one needs to take credit for it. Um, you know, yeah. give credit where credit is due. And that's my job is to be, be able to make sure that I pass out that credit where, wherever it's earned and, and wherever, it, wherever it's due. But at the end of the day, my team doesn't care who gets credit for it. As long as it's done the right way and it's done in the best interest of students, that that's really what, what that all, that all comes down to with the support team. But we meet uh, twice a week mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, twice, twice a month. And uh, or every other every other week, uh, but I am in contact with my assistant superintendents, with my CFO, with my controller, director of human resources, director of special uh, uh, ESS services, um, uh, student um, um, instructional support team. Yep, I am available to them whenever they need me. Mm. Whether I if I'm on if I'm on vacation, I will take their call because they know I'm on vacation. So if they're calling me, I know that it's something important that we need to sit and have a conversation. And it may just be a two minute conversation saying, yes, no, go ahead and do that. That's great. Thank you for checking in with me. And, and that'll be the last time I hear from them until I'm back from vacation. So, um, you know, again, it's building that trust and knowing who your people are and what, what they're capable of. Um, one, of the, one of the stories here within our organization is every principal that is on a campus is the captain of their own ship. I'm still the admiral. I still have, you know, the buck stops here 100% of the time, but they're, they're the captains of their ship and they are allowed to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. They're allowed to fail if they need to, but they made a decision. The decision didn't go the way they wanted it to. We have that conversation with them and say, okay, what was your thought process? How did we get here? What are we going to do so that, you know, this doesn't happen again next time? and trying to build up that confidence to be able to take it and run because the last thing that we need in education is people micromanaging other people. <laughs> Let people do their jobs. We hired them for a reason. Let them do their jobs. How, how do you do that? I know it's a, I know it's a, a simple question, but I just, I, I, I know leaders struggle with this so much. I, I think, and just before you answer that, I think, I think leaders struggle with how to, let people do their jobs without this, there's this fear that in six months time, you realize that they've gone off and done something completely um, off the, you know, they've just gone off the wire and it's like, oh no. So, uh, you know, say there's a leader out there going, I know that I, I want to release people and I want to create a culture where they can make more mistakes. How do I do that and, and address this fear that I have that they'll just run off and, and change everything? <laughs> I think the checks and balances is where is where this really really comes in. Making sure that you have, um, you know, it, whether it's one of my direct reports or maybe it's one of the principals at one of the campuses, wh wherever that person is in 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 our organizational chart, 
being able to have those open, transparent conversations with them. I'm not saying, and, and I'm not saying that this hasn't happened to us because it has. We've had, we've had uh, principals that have, and I'm going to say this in the nice possible way, gone rogue. Mm. And we have had to deal with that. We have had to, but if you have the layers of transparency and communication, especially in the communities we serve, mm. they're going to tell us that something's not right. They're going to share that information. They will come out and just, they'll put it out on social media all over the place and let you know without even talking to you that, <laughs> hey, your school messed up or your principal messed up. They'll, they'll, let, they'll let us know. And then it's all in, how do you deal with it? How do you, how do you, how do you then do the damage control? Mm. What, is that, what does that upstream thinking look like to be able to say, all right, yes, this principal messed up. And if it's something you know really egregious, then we have to obviously coach them out of the organization as well. So you coach up, coach out, you know, which, wh whatever it takes. But, um, but leaders can't be afraid of that. Leaders can't be afraid to let people do their jobs. They, they've got to be able to step back because if you are afraid of letting people do their jobs, you're not, you're, you're just micromanaging them. You're, yeah. you're micromanaging. Keep your eye on the ball. Trust yet verify. Trust yet verify. The, the thing that, um, that comes to mind for me as, as you unpack that is um, something I've, I've run into is leaders who feel like, say if I'm talking to someone who's at a departmental level, they feel like they've got certain KPIs, but then then they'll, they'll hear from their leader who comes in and says, actually, um, you know, I've just heard that this particular, you know, if you think in schools, you know, I've just, uh, you know, we've just heard that there's a bit of unhappiness around the curriculum. And they're going, well, wait a second, but and all my KPIs in this area I'm meeting. And, and it can feel like leaders react to one piece of information rather than actually getting a, a sort of a pulse check or sticking to the KPIs that they've set. This is something that I see again and again and again. How do you view that? How do you overcome it as a, as a leader? Um, and, and I guess I, I really love the way you approach this, Mark. So I'm interested to know how how you think about making sure if there's one piece of information that comes to you, what would you do as the leader to bring that to someone and make sure that you're being true to holding them to the KPIs you've set, to, set for them and not some other standard that all of a sudden appears? Ask the questions. Just ask the questions. Nothing accusatory. Nothing, you know, no, say, hey, you know, this, is, this, came, this came down the line. Um, can we have a conversation about this? I just want to get some, again, clarity. I just, I, I love, mm. and I'm going to tell you, I love that about you. The, the whole clarity piece. It just, that, that's, that's my life. That's what, that's, that's what I live. I, I ask the right questions to get clarity, not to accuse somebody, not to run them out of the organization. I just want to find out, okay, if this is being said, what can I help do to stop that? Mm. Because if it's coming from just one person, and, you know, depends on how egregious, again, that, that it mm. is, you know, do I need to open a full blown investigation or can I just have a conversation about it and just and then circle back with whoever made the accusation, say, listen, this is the information. What exactly did you hear? What exactly do you think is going on? Because I've got a different perspective. I just want to, again, I want to clarify it with the accuser. I want to clarify it with the person that's being accused. I want to be mm. able to find out just to get to the bottom of it. And leaders can't be afraid to ask those questions. They can't be afraid to step forward. And, you know, there, there are times when you need to know if you're, if you need to stand in front of your people, if you need to stand behind them or to the side of them, there are times and you need to make sure, again, it goes back to discernment. What do they need at that season in time of their life? Mm. How, how do you know? <laughs> I, I, that's so good. I, I, I have to ask, how do you know whether to stand in front of, behind or to the side uh, for you? And what does each of those look like? So, um, you know, you just asked me about the, um, uh, you know, the accusations, you know, one, one piece of it, one, you know, one, one person came forward with this piece of information that was, you know, uh, that was unfavorable to another employee. So with the employee that's being accused, you start out and you stand by the side and you ask them and just say, Hey, you know what? I heard this. This came down the line. What can you tell me about this? Because I want to make sure that I'm supporting you in the right way. So that support piece is right there, side by side, guide by the side kind of thing. Yeah. Then you can have a group 
or let's say people uh, people that come in with group think and mm. a whole bunch of accusations come in against against someone yeah okay now right now you're going to stand in front of them and you're and the reason you're going to stand in front of them is because you want to protect both sides to make sure that these accusations if they're true we want to protect the people who are making the accusations but if they're false we want to make sure we're protecting the individual that's being accused and so going through the whole process of in, that'd be like an, an investigation of some kind. Yeah. So that's when that's what standing in front would be. Standing behind is knowing that they have the ability to be able to move forward with whatever has been presented on their own and mm -hmm. trust that they're going to make the right decision. Now, sometimes that right decision may be that they're going to resign. If you're standing behind and you're and you'll you'll help them in that transition, but you're not going to stand in front of them and stop them. So. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's what you were looking for, but that's, that's, that's kind of my, my mentality on just knowing what your people need at whatever given time and season of their life. Yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, no, that's really good. I, I think I'm trying to, I'm trying to work out how it fits in that, um, in that sort of picture of in front, beside or behind. But one of the biggest things that I'd say uh, I hear from people who, who end up leaving a leader, you know, they leave a leader is that they didn't have my back. But I think that that might be a saying, but I think it, I think you've hit the nail on the head with what that looks like, because my, my experience is often there'll be uh, something comes to the leader and they react in a way where they don't do any of those three things. And I, I don't know what they're doing, but it's not, <laughs> it's not the guide from the side. It's not, it's not stepping in front of them and it's not having their back. Um, it's, it's something they, they ran the other way. They ran the other way. Mm, yeah, you're right. And yeah, that fight they, or flight. Yeah. <laughs> and they leave them isolated and, and that right. hard to come back from. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's something that, you know, and I, I hope, and I, I'm, I'm just speaking for myself here, but I hope that, um, you know, the members of my team, uh, understand that, uh, flight really isn't in my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and they, and I think most of them appreciate the fact that I'm, I'm a calculated risk taker and, um, I'm there to be able to help and support and, and defend our organization, um, mm -hmm. no matter what role you're in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I love that. Um, what I, what I'd like to do, Mark, is there's, this has just been so rich. I've enjoyed this so much. I, I think it would be great to do a part two down the track. Uh, because I I just I feel like I could um, ask twenty more questions, um, but where I want to land, um, so I'll I'll um, you know hopefully we can we can do that down the track and do a bit of a bit of a part two and and maybe hit on some of the other uh, some of the, some of the other thoughts around leadership that you have because I just know people are going to get so much out of this. But to land, uh, I guess to land today, is there a story that comes to mind that really. Uh, and I'm putting you on the spot here a little bit, but is there is there a story that comes to mind that really sums up your leadership ethos, or maybe for you? And this might be a bit similar to the seven questions that 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 you did, but a story that really you reflect on as a very meaningful story for you as a leader, or that you've come across that represents what leadership means to you. Sure. Um... I, I guess I can go back to when I first came on board with uh, with with this organization. Um, there were a lot of people that were very fearful that um, as a new leader um, that I was going to come in and hire all my own people and replace all of them. That those were actual words that were said to me in my office, uh, I think on day two. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, and and just to this day um there there is one individual that is working for the organization um that i've known for a long long time um mm -hmm. that came on a couple years after i started um i think he, i think he's been there three years now but um but when i met with the and they were they were called a management team back then um mm -hmm. i you know I've, I've changed that uh to a support team at this point Mm. But uh, as the management team, as I had those conversations with them, they started to see that I, I, I was there to see what their skill sets were. I wasn't mm. I, I didn't have 
I had a portfolio of people that would have loved to come work for me, but <laughs> why would I, why would I take somebody out of an organization that has the breadth and knowledge of how things have been going? Why would I take, why would I remove them from, from the organization? And so, so what I did was I, I actually built that trust layer in um, pretty quickly where mm -hmm. they knew I wasn't there to rock the, you know, tip, tip over the apple cart, um, if you will. I, I was there to be able to support each one of them and find what, what their strengths were. What did they want to do? What, you know, what were things that they weren't, and I'm going to say it in the nicest possible way, what, what weren't they good at? You know, what, what were, what were things that, yeah, you're not going to get there. I I'm, I'm having this conversation with you and I can tell just by the tears in your eyes as I'm just having a conversation <laughs> that you're not going to get there. Yeah. But you're really strong here. And this is where I need you. This is where I need you to excel. This is, this is your hero moment is to do this right here for this organization mm -hmm. and keep doing this over here and be that hero. So, um, I, I think, that was the that was the start of of really how EdKey, you know, our organization has turned the corner. Um, you know, we were we were losing three and a half uh, three three and a half million dollars a year when I came on, and um, that that that's that's a lot of money to lose. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and th then you know, just this this last year, we've had almost a ten million dollar swing. So wow. uh, we're yeah, we're, we have contingency, we, but we, you know, we push all that money back into the, back into the schools. Our po student population grew from 4,000 students to about 11,000. I mean, <laughs> that's, those are the things that, you know, people that have been with this organization for a long time, some people have been working for this organization for over 20 years. Wow. That's, that's, and, and that's when they first started. That's when this yeah. organization first started was 20 years ago. So hmm. they've been here the whole time. And so they've seen this tran th this transition. They've seen how it's gone from that management structure to a support structure. They've seen how it's gone from, you know, being financially at risk to financially viable. They've seen how our student outcomes have gone from, you know, mostly underperforming across the board to now outperforming state averages at most of our locations. So... Yeah. The, the, those are the people that we really need to talk to and we really need to, you know, keep them as that as that knowledge base. And that's what I did with the support team when I came on. I said, listen, we're going to find out what everybody does best and we're going to use that and we're going to really leverage those skill sets and make sure that you're successful for the success of the organization. And that's that's really the telltale sign of how things have gone since 2016. Yeah. That's that's an incredible story, and uh, I just want to say to those who might be listening, who feel like maybe they're in a 2016, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. uh, experience, um, that they should be encouraged because it is possible. Uh, and, and you know, one of my favourite mantras is that Patrick, Patrick Lencioni uh, saying, which he talks about in terms of building teams, that it's both uh, possible and remarkably simple, uh, but painfully difficult. And I think you've gone through the painfully difficult work of picking two transparency, kindness, and communication. And uh, what was the other one? Integrity? Yes. Transparency, yeah. transparency, integrity, communication, and kindness. And I think they're, um, they're amazing core values. And I think, uh, yeah, that would be my encouragement to those listening who might, who might listen and go, oh, that would be amazing. It is possible. And uh, wow, there's so many great takeaways uh, from. From this conversation so thank you so much for for sharing mark i really appreciate your time well thank you i it was my pleasure being on and you know i look forward to uh you know again all the wonderful things you're doing out there as well i just i i can't thank you enough for for the leadership that you bring to uh to the to the world thank you mark you're, you're very kind and uh uh, I know this is going to be a, uh, a real uh, blessing to, to every leader who listens. So I just want to encourage you all out there who, who might be listening uh, that you can uh, go and implement some of these things and keep taking your leadership, keep investing in people, uh, which is really in one way sums up Mark's approach and, uh, and we, can, we can change the world by, by investing in people and, uh, and supporting. I love that picture, being a supporter, a team of supporters. Uh, and thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. Don't forget to subscribe or follow wherever you listen. It helps to keep you in the loop. And if today helped you, if you got something out of that, then please share with your network. That way we can reach more people. We can invest in them to become everything they're meant to be. And you can do that on social media, any way you like. And another thing that helps us out a lot here at the Leadership Conversations podcast is if you leave us a review wherever you're listening. Uh, We also have a free resource for you. It's called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57-page ebook uh, that contains interviews with 10 great leaders from around the world. You can go to consultclarity.org. It's right there at the top of the homepage, and it's completely free. We also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and you can subscribe to that by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. And last of all, you can check out my book, It's about how to deal with difficult people. I wrote this book because 50% of my coaching sessions uh, or thereabouts, this topic would come up. I believe it's one of the biggest challenges for leaders today. And so I wrote this book. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book if you want to buy it from there. Uh, That's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time. And I really hope that today has helped you take another step towards becoming everything you're meant to be. See you next time.